Frederick Fall Lamery has a very interesting and diverse background, with a strong focus on understanding human perception, behavior, and creativity. His work at the Center for Intelligent Machines at McGill and his PhD at Brown University both seem to have given him a broad, multidisciplinary perspective on the intersection of computing, psychology, neuroscience, philosophy, and mathematics. His focus on 3D shape understanding and his collaborations with artists like Bra Hatcher, William Latham, Patrick Tracet, and Daniel Berrio suggest that he is interested in exploring the boundaries between human and machine creativity, and in understanding how AI and other advanced technologies can enhance or complement human creativity rather than replace it. His two R&D consulting activities, London Geometry and DYNICON, also reflect his interest in applying AI and computer graphics to a range of real-world problems, from interactive visualizations and games to biodiversity monitoring. Overall, it seems like Frederick Fall Lamery is a visionary thinker who is interested in exploring the frontiers of human creativity and understanding how AI and other advanced technologies can help us push those boundaries even further. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Julio, thank you, Alvis, for inviting me. It's great to be back. Title of my talk: AIM, Art, Intelligence, Machine. So I want to pitch to you the idea that we can uh, put together these three main themes. Uh, and I will emphasize what I mean by intelligence in particular later in the talk. Uh, I see art and tools, which today I would consider as machines and extensions such as computers and robots, uh, to have co-evolved through time. Um, and we could discuss uh, these topics later if you're interested. What's the place of AI in all this? For me, uh, AI is mainly about studying and understanding humans. And again, uh, I, I think we could have uh, good discussions about this theme. Uh, and beyond that, I see the potential of AI to extend our intelligence. But again, I'll, I'll come back to uh, a definition of intelligence shortly. And I want to illustrate uh, the topic of uh, art, intelligence, and machine with some projects. In particular, this project, uh, which was running about 10 years ago, but it uh, still has a life today, called ICON, or the Automated Iconograph, was a collaboration with uh, French artist Patrick Tresset, where we tried to understand how the artist conceives of a style, a particular style, over, over practice and time. And uh, in this case, Patrick was focusing on portraiture. Uh, eventually, uh, we put up together a plan for trying to sort of study uh, the practice of uh, portraiture. And here you have a very high level illustration of a description of uh, different processes that are involved. This is uh, design in, in uh, discussions uh, with the artist. And I would say, so 10 years ago, uh, we had achieved very little uh, part of that diagram and we had some understanding especially of the sort of compu early computer vision. Uh, we had no uh, say on, for example, how to capture experience. Uh, today, however, with uh, progress in AI, we are actually able to address pretty much all the, the main themes that are here. The way we work is uh, after coming up with a good concept of how the artist thinks and uh, will go about realizing a portrait here, uh, we produce some computational models and we iterate through these. And this is a, an early result from about 2005 or 6, where we had the first computational system, which was approximating the uh, type of style that Patrick had uh, sort of uh, realized over time. So it, it's a very uh, rapid type of sketching. And here you probably will notice that this is done by a machine because the uh, regularity and exactitude of the traces are, are not what a human would typically do. Uh, so in order to go a bit beyond that, after a few years of reflections, um, we came up with uh, the idea that we should try to relate more closely to the human by Re designing and realizing a robotic, a robotic uh, system. So this is our robotic system around 2010, first presented at the Kinetica Art Fair. 
and uh, we call it Paul the Robot, and all it is is an arm, an articulated arm, uh, which can hold a pen, it has a wrist, it has a camera, the camera can look around and find faces, and then uh, can start uh, realizing a portrait in a style closer to what Patrick is uh, typically doing when he does his own portrait. So here's a sort of example. This has been presented at many art fairs and conferences over the years. So you saw the, the camera, has found a face, and now the arm is executing a, a sketch. Uh, the sort of brain or nervous system is under the table. It's, it's represented by the laptop. And now you have a quality in the traces, which is really interesting because we have this sort of stylistic signature which relates to uncertainty of each movement, and these movements are uh, related to what a human would do. So you, you reach a certain quality which was, for us, at the time, very difficult, if, if even possible, to realize with a purely software approach. So we were quite happy um, with this kind of result. Uh, here's a more, much more recent uh, example where Patrick continues to explore this space. He has now his own studio based in Brussels, and he does all kinds of performance around the world. And this system is uh, an illustration of a collaborative mode between robot and, and human, where the, in this case a human provides an input, a guess, and the machine uh, helps uh, the artist by completing it. So this was sort of an illustration of the entire uh, program of AIM. And now I would like to focus in the few minutes that I have on uh, the topic of intelligence. So w when we uh, consider all the work that's going on in AI, in particular these days, which we hear almost every day about with some new development, we rarely take the time to sit and consider what do we mean by intelligence. Uh, so here I, I'm sort of presenting to you a definition of intelligence that I find very useful. Uh, in particular, it's been uh, promoted by Michael Levin, who's a biologist and mathematician, and Daniel Dennett, a well-known philosopher of the mind. Uh, I invite you to uh, look at this paper, Cognition All the Way Down in Open Access, very interesting. And this, the notion here is that the concept of intelligence is generic across uh, biology, or if you want, evolution even, of species. Uh, the definition is, uh, has two main dimensions, uh, spatial extent, essentially your cognitive horizon is represented as a species by how, f how far can you act in the world and even eventually modify it by exerting actions. And then there's a time dimension which is about your memory, but also about your power of prediction or making some predictions. Now. What's interesting, I think, here is that if we accept this kind of definition for intelligence as a starting point, it implies that we have to reflect about, for example, AI in the context of a body. Um, so the body is crucial in exerting notions of intelligence. Now, this definition is quite generic and it doesn't satisfy me because what I'm really interested in is finding out what makes humans humans, what makes them different from other species. So the cognitive horizon is sort of across the board and I would like to specialize it. So I propose to you that there are three main characteristics that distinguishes us mainly from other species. Um, art, I, I call it art, but uh, it's basically the uh, creativity dimension. Uh, machines or tools starts with tools, uh, the manipulation of tools and how it allows us to exert modification on our environment. Again, a unique feature of uh, the human species or Homo sapiens sapiens, shall I say. Language being the third main component uh, that we don't, uh, at least we don't think exist in other species, at least not at the level uh, that we have. And all together, these three elements allow us to continuously feed back and increase our cognitive horizon, which is also a distinguishing feature if you compare with other species. Through our life as individuals, we can extend our cognitive uh, horizon and as 
uh, human species, we've been continuously increasing our cognitive horizons. We have this capacity of archi archiving knowledge in particular. Um, I'm just looking at much time. I have a couple of minutes left. So I will take the advantage of that to present you more recent work, which takes a bit the, the same flavor as what you saw before. Uh, this is work now with Daniel Berrio. So after the work with Patrick Tresse on portraiture, which had uh, an horizon which was more of sort of high-level view on how to get to a result which is comparable to what the human produces, we start to look more into the details and we focused on especially on the influence of movement on the quality of the traces. And this is work uh, ongoing with Daniel Berrio, Italian artist, uh, who has joined Goldsmith as well. The main hypothesis here is that, and this is a sort of a result that is known in cognitive science for a number of decades, is that movement is actually recoverable from traces. So when you see uh, a piece of art uh, in a museum, on a painting, uh, you will, if you can see the traces of how the, the painting was produced, for example, or the drawing, uh, this will influence how you, you judge uh, the quality of what has been produced. So this is a, an hypothesis. It's been observed in cognitive science, people do tests with humans, etc. So there's a lot of evidence that this is correct. In neuroscience, for example, we can see that the brain, the motor uh, part of the brain, motor control, will light up more uh, when you're seeing uh, a piece where the traces are very evident, uh, although you're not producing any movement. Uh, so part of your nervous system is reacting. And for, uh, as a sort of simple example, here's a piece of calligraphy where uh, if we start asking any of you, you will come up with a potential way of creating this calligraphy and more or less you will agree um, on how it's done. Uh, and again, we, we could run the test later if you wanted. Uh, the, the project itself has a number of collaborators, just mentioned some of the main ones, so we're not doing this alone. We go through a similar process as with Patrick Tresse and the portraiture system. So initially we were studying with the artist how do they produce calligraphy. Danielle is an expert in graffiti art or street art. Uh, we produce some mathematical model that, rep that captures the movement, the essence of the movement. And I could go into the details, but I don't have time. But the, basically the drawing that you see in the middle uh, is made of these sort of bell shapes uh, functions. And these functions correspond to different trajectories and targets that you may follow and capture the, cinemat the kinematic part of, of the movement. Once we have a, such a good model and the computational drawings are satisfying, then we can test um, the system with a, a robotic uh, uh, contraption. So we can even, of course, do simulation first, which is common in robotics, uh, to give you a flavor. So these traces uh, correspond fairly closely to what the human does. And by, by human here, I mean human expert. Uh, we've worked also with uh, so-called uh, compliant robots. So these are robots where the human can actually uh, interact with the robot. They're s safe. <laughs> they're so for example, if they move and they touch you, they will stop. So these are interesting platforms. They have also, they're very hard to control. And that brings some uncertainty in the movement, which is actually uh, a nice feature to have because the human is similar. Uh, more recent work, which is uh, in the area of calligraphy again. And this is uh, in collaboration with the team in Germany, uh, which is one of our main col collaborators at Constance University, uh, just gi giving you a flavor of what's, what's going on. This is actually doing a portrait in a calligraphic style. Uh, this is a system uh, in Constance, uh, so they, they have produced so-called E-David system. Uh, the, I consider this is probably the most advanced painting robotic system, if you're interested. Uh, we can give you pointers uh, to them. Um, and this is more of a plug, uh, finishing my talk, but we have a new project that is starting called, uh, acronym is eagva.org. There's a little website, there's not much, but it's just started, so if you're interested, please follow us. It involves a number of people, number of teams across drawing, calligraphy, painting, uh, and this is sort of part of the team. I've highlighted uh, the female uh, members uh, since it's a special day today. Uh, it's a very powerful team. We have people in philosophy, psychology, sociology, robotics, visual arts, computing, etc. 
so to finish, just want to re-emphasize that I consider that the practices uh, that we call art, essentially creative practices, are actually fundamental to who we are as humans and they should influence the AI agenda, research agenda as well and this is what I'm exploring and I think we'll take questions after all the talks so uh, we'll see you later. Thank you. Thank you. Shijay is an accomplished associate director at Zaha Hadid Architects, where he is a co-founder and leads the computation and design research group, Shaycode, which he established in 2007. He is an aspiring polymath who pursues his scientific interests in digital design and robotic fabrication as a PhD candidate at the Block Research Group BRG at the F Zurich and as a MIFL, graduate from the University of Bath, UK. Shijay is also a graduate from and a studio master at the Postgraduate Course of Design Research Laboratory at the Architectural Association London, ADRL, where he explores the intersection of computer graphics, video games, urban development, and modern methods of construction. With a keen interest in interdisciplinary research, Shijay has made significant contributions to the field of architecture and design and his expertise in computation and design is highly regarded in the industry. Um, yeah, thanks uh, to Alvisa and Julio for the invitation, and uh, it's great to be back at Arup uh, in person. Um, and um, as um, the AI introduced me, like, j I'll skip this one, like, but my interests, uh, I've been relatively lucky to be uh, have a kind of ringside view of some of the uh, leading professional academic and research in arenas of uh, computational design, um, particularly at the design research lab, which is just a few hundred meters from here, where like a lot of this has been being explored for the last 20 plus years. Um, so all of this, like the interest for us uh, is both at ZHA and at DRL and also at the Block Research Group where, where I did my PhD is to create somewhat like or re-engage with like ancient Vitruvian principles of what uh, good architecture should be and the value of the built environment uh, is, is indeed um, constituted uh, through engaging in responsible design um, not not just like sustainability but uh, on the other hand also kind of social uh, and, and delightful aspects about the built environment. Um, uh, for, uh, a principal reason for that is like like unloved buildings, as we know, are th perhaps the most unsustainable of all all buildings, and the built environment is full of those, uh, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> and and so, what can we do as designers, as arch uh, as engineers, um, and fabricators to to avoid that? Um, so one of the things that we thought of like when we did this uh, pilot project, uh, which is still ongoing in, on a remote island in, in Honduras, uh, was to try and engage the end user um, in, into the process. So we, we tried to use um, video game technology to, to invite people, uh, end users and buyers, uh, in, into the design process, um, insofar as it's possible, obviously. Um, and so in that sense, we, cr we created a system uh, of curated parts, like, and explored the combinatorial space. Um, in, in this particular system, that they, c um, they can select a site in 3D, negotiate uh, the pixels that they buy from uh, their neighbors, and so on. And, and so it was, what was interesting in this pilot project, like which we hope to build uh, this year, uh, it's in uh, Reba stage four, uh, was more on the front end. Like how we obviously created a whole lot more work for us, like because we had to create for every user action, like which pixels they choose, like we have to compute like some form of uh, response um, that you know, if it is the middle pixels or the end pixels, and and also all of those obviously have to work structurally and have to work you know, within the cost uh, remit and so on. But what we found uh, by front loading the design process uh, what was very interesting is that for the investors, like they at least already know what kind of 
unit mix they need to have, which is a typical problem with uh, with developers because, uh, particularly in London, they're regulated to to already have X number of three bedroom, two bedroom, one bedroom houses, whereas we found like you know of all the options that we had designed, like only two or three are actually popular, and in this particular demographic, right, and um, and also like we can get a firm order in, in the sense of like how much time it takes to convert raw material into into and into the built outcome so removing a lot of contingency uh, typically embedded in these processes so the second as second pilot project that I wanted to t uh, briefly touch upon is is a uh, bridge a uh, prototype footbridge that we did for Venice uh, in 2021 uh, with the block research group. Uh, which tries to go uh, look back at some of the ancient principles of uh, masonry design and how that can be applied to to uh, digitizing concrete, which we all know can be thought of as a synthetic stone, uh, which is very good in compression. Um, so we were trying to inherit like this kind of masonry or stone creativity, um, both spatially in a spatially engaging way, but also in a sustainable use way. Um, and Block Research Group has already shown that masonry, when applied to uh, concrete, uh, can can literally save uh, a lot of concrete, but also a lot of steel. Uh, so these principles of masonry design, like which we wanted to apply for the first time for three D concrete printing, which typically is uh, horizontal printing and the printing is only used as formwork it is never used as the actual uh, material so in in this case we showed that like the printed outcome blocks can actually be dry assembled and used as a structural material rather than having to cast uh, regular concrete into it so uh, this so this footbridge prototype is entirely dry assembled um, each block is each of the 53 blocks is custom printed um, and on, in addition, like we made use of uh, the, the layers are non-parallel and aligned with uh, the compressive uh, force directions, right? So that fully engages the concrete, reduces the need for any reinforcement within within the structure, and all the uh, steel that is is at the bottom just tying the feet together. So, um, so machine augmentation, we think, like in a way, kind of really as enables us to deliver on these two aspects of sustainable development, which is, on the one hand, buildings and structures have to be engaging spatially, people, um, and, and on, on the other hand, it also, uh, you know, it's, it's a matter of shape design first and then material design next. Um, so, and I will leave you with this provocation that, uh, unlike what we may imagine, large parts of both the virtual and the physical world architects and are not really involved and so in our absence what we get are these kind of dingbats right like and um so how how can we move that needle just that little bit more uh, so that we can um, actually contribute a lot more professionally designed buildings into the built environment, which currently is maybe like just one or two percent. So in this sense, like we genuinely invite uh, the progress being made in, in, in AI uh, so that we hope that like some of the more proven tropes can act actually be uh, disseminated into the built environment. So and in that sense, uh, deal with the scarcity of good examples like so the the built environment should actually be a treasury of uh, proven assets which any AI should be able to learn from but currently what is it's learning from is like a lot of um, you know unsatisfactory examples so and and so we think um, in a way like to avoid the garbage in garbage out uh, problem can we like uh, think of the built environment as as our uh, in the Vitruvian sense as a true repository of um, good uh, good well well considered well thought of uh, design examples which can then be proliferated through through the use of AI. So just to leave you with a few images, that's what we've been doing like for the last uh, ten plus years, like trying to prototype these kind of design. Uh, digital fabrication systems, uh, creatively explore them, and those are beginning to contribute to the buildings that we are doing uh, within, within, within our practice, and, and we hope that AI can uh, help us uh, have a far greater uh, impact. Thank you. 
Ting is a versatile and passionate product manager and interaction designer who is committed to making emerging technologies accessible and safe. She has worked on a range of data projects at Arup, which demonstrates her ability to apply her skills and expertise to different contexts. Her work on using computer vision for tunnel inspection and quantifying the urban heat island effect using remote sensing data showcases her knowledge and experience in leveraging emerging technologies to solve real-world problems. Ting's double master's degree in innovation design engineering from the Royal College of Art and Imperial College London indicates her strong foundation in both product design and software development. This interdisciplinary background likely allows her to create digital experiences that not only function well, but also connect people in a fun and approachable way. Overall, Ting's experience and skills make her a valuable asset to Arup that aims to leveraging emerging technologies to create accessible and user-friendly products. Good evening, everyone. Uh, yeah, thanks for being here, and thanks for the AI to introduce. It's always a bit awkward to hear what other people like describe me. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about um, yeah creating connection between people and build environment. So uh, well, we'll talk about this creator in a bit. So this is like setting up the the, the thing. Um, just before I dive into the work I'm doing, Arab, just uh, some projects I've done prior to joining Arab, um, also on the topic that we're um, discussing today around computational creativity, robotics, and AI. So I've been, these are some of my past work prior to joining Arab as a, a designer that have done a, a, a robotic arm that played back the movement of, of the the video, uh, the movement of the camera alongside the video, I think kind of linked to uh, Frederick mentioned how we replicate the human movement and also looking at how we can find hidden association of the images around us by taking a picture, how can we use uh, technology like natural language processing on top of the image search to find link of uh, uh, hidden images. And the last one here is actually a decade ago that um, I work uh, with the team on this sentiment analysis of tweets. So to look at the, um, the emotion of the day and then use that as the input to the motor of this looming machine. So to create scarf um, that represents the emotion of the day on the internet. So yeah, these are just kind of my setting up the context of my passion in finding data and connect human to, to um, um, the environment around it virtually and phys physically. So yeah, so um, diving into the project I've done in Arab, so I uh, really resonate with what uh, Shajay mentioned about an uh, unloved building, which uh, would be a most unsustainable building. So for the project I'm going to show in a bit is uh, this creature, some of the colleagues might see it on this, this screen from time to time. There's like this fluffy things that come on the screen every now and then. And what it actually does is to represent um, the condition of the of this of this eighty shallistry of this uh, building. So using the data that we collected, so the occupancy rate of the uh, the the office, the noise level, the CO two emission, etc. So the idea really is to build this connection. Like how can we create uh, evoke empathy and increase the awareness of our impact to the building by having a more approachable and fun way to represent it instead of using a bar chart or a Excel spreadsheet or a Power BI dashboard. You know, having a fun way. So the idea is really straightforward: is to think about imagine there's a creator that is. DNA just change so rapidly that react to the surrounding immediately that we can see how it change. So, um, so this is the concept at the beginning. Um, the color of the creator represent the pollution, the pollutant of, of the area of the environment, and the tentacle kind of uh, represent noise level. So really, to kind of using this uh, more visualize and playful way to say, okay, how is the creator gonna change according to the environment? You can see this grumpy one on the side. I really like this one, it's probably too cute to say this is actually a bad condition. So there needs some <laughs> iteration on that one, but you can kind of see that, okay, the life expectancy of this creature might change because of the um, data that we collected from the environment. So it kind of create this connection and emotional uh, uh, association with this digital objects, which can perhaps make us like the building a bit more, we want to come to the office a bit more. So that's really the idea behind it. And yeah, we've done some more brainstorming around how it looks, how it should interact with people, um, the color of it. Uh, so yeah, work with Julia's team, uh, a lot of 
people, probably not here today, um, help us to make this happen. So we use uh, Unity and uh, yeah, various design tools that uh, get the input real time from the building and use this kind of generative approach to create the appearance of this creature. So yeah, I think this is just a quick video. If you haven't seen it before, this is <laughs> the final kind of uh, um, outcome of the creation. So the color of it actually show the humidity. Oh, it's sad that day because there's no one in the office. <laughs> and then the, home, the, the leaves that are falling down on in the background uh, represent the CO2 level in the, in the office. But yeah, so that's it for me. Well, thank you. Thank you. We can start uh, uh, with the first question. Here is a question for Frederick Fourlay Marie. Given your background in both computing and the visual arts, how do you see AI and other advanced technologies shaping the future of creative practice in fields like art, design, and architecture? What opportunities and challenges do you see arising from the integration of these technologies, and how can we ensure that they are used in a way that enhances human creativity and expression rather than replacing it? I think uh, we're in the age of AI being uh, used by uh, young artists, so uh, the students at Goldsmiths, for example, or other institutions in London and across the world are definitely engaging with these uh, systems. Uh, so it's already there. Uh, so not, we will not avoid it. Uh, I see opportunities in in the re in driving the research with this community, which is uh, sort of a new phenomenon. So up till a few years ago, um, artists that engage with the digital realm um, had was a rather small community. Uh, so at the moment, I, I would say the size of it is is exploding. And the sociological impact of that is to be found. found. I, I don't know how it's going to evolve, uh, how to predict. Um, it's going to be really interesting to see the sort of uh, future generations of, of students that arrive and how, how advanced uh, the production that they will present in their portfolio will be, I suppose. Um, and. Um, I guess the technology is sort of democratizing, democratizing digital art. So digital art used to be uh, sort of a niche area. Uh, you had to invest in it. It was not supported by the art world. Um, so only recently you see digital artists actually being paid reasonable amounts for the art they produce. And up till very recently, you could hardly, even the sort of well-known artist in the field of digital art, uh, would have a hard time to make it to uh, an art gallery uh, or even a museum. Uh, mm -hmm. There are very few museums who have solid collections of digital art. Although digital art, if you look at the history, is very old. It goes basically to the beginning of computers uh, in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and and uh, the UK has uh, many of the pioneers uh, in that field, uh, some of which are still with us, luckily. Uh, but they are pretty much uh, you know, not ignored, but unknown by the main uh, sort of the greater public. So I think uh, where we stand is that uh, this is going to open this space to everybody, and people will realize that a lot has already happened, and a lot more will happen now. Uh, I, th I think we're just uh, at a very interesting time in this field. Towards a regenerative design. It is important the built environment we design will have a long life and will be loved. From your vast experience, would you know of any work in measuring and predicting the emotional response to the built environment? So, um, maybe Frederick, would you like to address the question? Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, so, built environment per se, it's not the area that I know the best, but in terms of emotion uh, measurements, um, I see a lot of work. Uh, my background is computer vision originally, so there's been a lot of attempts to use computer vision approaches to judge uh, the type of emotions that people have. And you can imagine 20 years ago, you could easily have uh, lots of data from a webcam or these kind of inputs became available. So there's been a lot of work in that direction. Um, the current trend that I see is that 
with with the big data approach of AI, which is sort of the winner take all approach at the moment, the, the, the there is a sort of a tension because I think uh, we lose the fact that emo emotivity is a very personal thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, we see the kind of results I see coming out is, is sort of an average. You, you get systems that might be very good at judging the average emotion of, of a room, let's say, many of us here. Uh, but if, if I want to know or if you wanted to address uh, the feelings of a person in particular, well, this is, I think, not very well addressed. And it, it's not obvious to use a data-driven approach in that con for that particular problem. Uh, so I s for me, that would be sort of uh, the, the near future. Hopefully, we, we can address uh, this kind of um, issue in the context of judging emotion uh, of people. In the end, for me, uh, you probably got that from my talk, uh, it should be centered on the humans. Uh, what do we need uh, this for? Uh, also, we should, uh, we should consider. Um, and uh, the risk uh, we see, for example, in social networks is that we, s we, we might impose an emotion level, which is again coming from sort of a, an average measurement rather than something that is really useful to the individual. Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, I think just going back to one of the examples that I showed around using sentiment analysis for the, um, the tweet. Um, yeah, I guess that's one way to. Uh, Kind of analyze the data and show the emotion, but I think as it, yeah, Frederick mentioned, it's it's quite arbitrary in a way that it is is not necessarily like accurate or really represent the emotion. It's p uh, the the analysis that we use is p merely looking at whether the sentence is positive, neutral, or negative. So I think that's just um, yeah, a lot of work that can be done, and probably a lot more advanced in other discipline than in the building environment that we're seeing. We usually measure say the com how, how comfortable the environment is instead of the you know emotion it's more like the, the physical reaction to it so I think that there are yeah more measures that can be done there so sentiment analysis of real real environments I think I fi find that um, like like with everything else like the answers to these uh, questions like I look at in two places one is in history of architecture and the other is in video games um, and and in both places, like there has been a long history, of course, of like designing urban form uh, with with uh, you know a, a way to reason about its impact on humans, uh, not not just the building ergonomics, not just the comfort aspect, but like the the real um, uh, cog you know perceptual impact, like you know. So so if we can think of like emotional response in like uh, two levels. One is like at the base level, you first have to perceive certain things before which you can have a response to that. So and and so in that sense, like you know, the invention of the perspective and and its full employment in the design of urban form, like in in the Renaissance and and so on, like were the early uh, frameworks to reason about emotional um, impact on how to design for that emotional impact. I would say. Um, and some of that like can be now done at like real impactful scale, like with agent based modeling um, that are typically used in video games, but like and also you know like engineering practices like Arrow, you know you have mass motion, which they're typically only using agents to figure out how people are exiting a building or running away from a fire or so on but you could embed those agents with these simple um, perceptual computer vision algorithms, like and um, at least it gets you somewhere to begin to reason about the emotional impact. Um, uh, and uh, that's where I think, like in general, more than data-driven analysis, like the first step should be a, a way to reason about it. And, and that's where um, both history and video games, I think, really provide a, a method to reason. Uh, it might not be accurate, it might not be f get you there fully, but uh, I think it's a good, good way to start. Yeah. That, that's great. Thank you, Shajay. And let's hear from uh, uh, the AI what it has to say about the question. Yes, there has been some work in measuring and predicting the emotional response to the built environment. One well-known approach is called biophilic design, 
which is the practice of incorporating natural elements such as plants and sunlight into the built environment to promote well-being and reduce stress. Another approach is called evidence-based design, which uses research to inform design decisions that support positive health outcomes. This approach has been applied to hospitals, schools, and other types of buildings with the goal of creating spaces that improve the emotional and physical well-being of occupants. There are also tools and methods that can be used to measure the emotional response to the built environment, such as questionnaires, surveys, and physiological measures like heart rate variability and skin conductance. These methods can provide insights into how people respond to different design features and can help designers make decisions that support positive emotional responses. Overall, creating a built environment that supports emotional well-being requires a deep understanding of how people interact with their surroundings, as well as a commitment to ongoing research and innovation in design. Great, so you guys can judge <laughs> whether we are still uh, needed or, or maybe less. Uh, thank you. I think that maybe it's time, uh, Giulio, to move on to a, a, a real human question. And there was a, an excellent question earlier around skills, skills that we should concentrate on when uh, so much of uh, the prepping and the reading of the results of uh, computation is now being taken over by machines. And maybe we start from, uh, from Frederick. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thanks. Uh, so this, uh, yeah, interesting uh, area. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I think, um, like any revolution, technology, uh, driven by technology, it uh, it will create a movement of adaptation. Um, I guess the, the typical example that's brought is photography, uh, 19th century, uh, late 19th century, and how it changes um, what creatives do with visual outcomes. Um, it impacts all the fields. Um, so I would expect that this is what's going to happen, is, is, is that uh, the, the new tools or the new possibilities will create an effect of a sort of reaction and uh, we will see new generations engage in a different way on the basis of what's there. Um, I would expect, so we mentioned the democratization before, uh, so I would expect that we will see a larger part of the community which is really well informed about uh, the visuals, if I think, I'm more working on the visual area, so let's say the visual uh, possibilities um, in a way will be finally moving beyond uh, the 20th century um, in terms of visual impacts. Uh, so, f you know, the, the revolution of the Picasso, the Dali and all that, mm -hmm. well, uh, you know, you'll be exposed to that when you, you're a six-year-old, or maybe even before. Uh, it, it won't be um, the new frontier anymore. It was the frontier when I grew up, maybe when you grew up as well, I don't know. Um, so I think that's going to change, and what will be the outcome will be really interesting. Um, from a researcher point of view, or, or someone like me who uh, works in the, these kinds of areas, and uh, you have the challenge of having new students, uh, new researchers, you have to set new research agendas. Uh, for us, the challenge is more um, how can we uh, take uh, the context that we have and uh, see uh, where can we take that elsewhere. Uh, so if you work with people who want to have an artistic pra practice, which is the kind of people I tend to work with, um, they don't want to redo what has already been done or what anybody else can do easily. So um, it sets sort of a, a new frontier. Uh, what could be done given the current state of technology or the near future of technology so that uh, the, the new artists, the new artistic practices will happen and what could that be? Uh, so it, it's basically giving us, uh, you know, a kick in the back and uh, looking forward. Um, so I think it's very exciting. Thank you. And uh, and Goldsmith, I imagine, is more uh, successful than ever. 
uh, in attracting students. Ah, uh, I, Are you, okay. Do you have so, a huge so growth a, of... Uh, of uh, this is uh, a very interesting topic as well, but I think it's, it's, it's a sort of a, you know, it's, it's tangential or, or going in another direction. So yes, we have, it seems, uh, I don't follow exactly the figures, but mm. definitely the number of students has gone down. Uh, but the, the, the type of students we get has changed. Mm -hmm. uh, it's much more international, it's much more mm. um, people from abroad. Uh, the, so I think the, the amount uh, have gone up. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's all kinds of reasons and they, I don't think they're linked to uh, the topics necessarily that we're discussing. Uh, the sociological, economic. Uh, so it's fine in terms of attracting uh, people of the world to the UK in these fields. I think the UK is still seen as a very happening place, um, and we could, dis you know, we, yeah, could yeah. we could look at okay. why is it happening this way rather than another way. Uh, but there's no uh, big crisis coming up, if you want. Yeah. No, I was thinking that is a, is a temple of creativity from uh, from outside. Yes. And therefore, yeah. because creativity is uh, something the machines uh, seems to be struggling a bit with, uh, then it's a good place to go and uh, and, and gather skills. I I I'd like to pass on maybe shooting. Uh, you you give us. Uh, the RCA also is great place. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think I, I'm probably talking just from our point of view since I, since I work, work here. Um, I think Most a lot. Kids. <laughs> Most kids. <laughs> Not while I work here. Um, I think uh, a lot of times to un you know understand the constraints, the characteristic, the limitation, the possibility of the technology. To really know, under like understanding, yeah, what what it is like to to play. It's like a new material. Right? We can play with it, so to understand characteristics. I have one artist that uh, doing sculpture, you want to understand the poetry, you want to under connect with the clay, and things. I think it's like kind of similar, I'm like thinking along the similar line like that. And um, another thing I kind of want to add is um, right now the, the, the model, the AI, it is trend on the data that we produce. So it's kind of uh, um, important to think, is the data Good, like because it's learning from humans, so it kind of like need to think about um, what the what we let the machine learn from. Is, is it a good thing that <laughs> we we they learn from us, or or, or, or the bad thing? I think that just yeah. It's, yeah. So we are going to lose a lot of managers and gain a lot of cu data curators. Yeah, it could be or like uh, some data, even the QA to understand whether the quality of the data is good or not. Ah, I wonder whether we have a M Moodle course on data QA. Thank you. Uh, well, I, th I think that um, fundamentally there's, there's a dearth of 3D skills and, and the world needs a lot and lot and lot of spatial content, uh, whether it is to build uh, physical cities, like you know, to host the two and a half billion more people that's gonna live in cities in by 2050, uh, or even like you know, in the virtual world, like there's so much demand for, or soon enough there will be a lot of demand for 3D content, um, and somebody's gonna fill those those gaps and and or meet that demand. And I think like AI, uh, the more we can get close to these force multipliers like it, the more impact we can have I think um, and uh, and as was pointed out like and I also think that like we provide need we need to provide the good examples that that AI can force multiply and uh, and populate in the rest of the where there is demand because there are not enough architects engineers and you know, trained people to, to meet the demand um, as is without with, without like these additional uh, demand. Um, so I, I do think that, and also the virtual could be a very good way to for us to improve uh, our, our own skills, right? Our own uh, expertise, like because there's so much more uh, speed at which you have to deliver the content, like, and so that I think is also a good uh, use of AI to just improve ourselves, like uh, to, to, um, to, to, to do better. Like, like chess was transformed, like now no player worth their salt is gonna train without software, right? Like, and so, so to me it is like 
it's it's even like a moot point that like whether architects and engineers should consider AI. I mean, that's of course like because there's no other way uh, to 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 improve ourselves. Like and um, and and another th interesting thing is that machine on their own might beat a human, but like in, interestingly, both in chess and in Go. A machine paired with a, a human beats a machine, uh, and and that's that's also very interesting. Like that has been repeated with Go and uh, um, and and chess, and many other uh, kind of creative uh, fields, where like uh, combining human intelligence with like machine intelligence is like genuinely, I feel like the way to go. Thank you. That's brilliant. A great question. So, is there any other question from the audience? We're going to take another couple of questions. I'm going to come up with the microphone so we get a record. Can you say your name? Sure. Uh, yeah, my name is Pradesh. I uh, belong from the Fazar teams of Arab. Um, first of all, great presentations. Um, I, I have a question for obviously everyone. Um, since and also, Mr. Sajay mentioned two and a half billion people would be uh, living by 2050. And uh, I guess most of the people would be from the developing nations. And the majority of the development will come from there. So how do you think um, such uh, fab digital fabrication tools or uh, all these advancement in AI would be helpful for uh, a relatively low GDP per capita sort of uh, places um, where where we are going to have higher development. Uh, secondly, how, I mean, are we thinking about uh, uh, creating more tools? So recently there was, obviously everyone knows ChatGPT, but there was also a recent tool called RoomGPT, which uh, basically gives you the entire render of the uh, um, uh, uh, room uh, based on uh, the input. So are we seeing more such tools like structural GPT or you know something of similar sort, uh, and these people in uh, developing nations love tools, right? Which are uh, you know very repetitive, and they can uh, consume more data, and they can give uh, such information. So, are we moving towards that phase, or how is it like? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, Who wants to well, start? Maybe I can answer because I'm from India, and um, and and uh, perhaps, and also we do a lot of work in China, so. Um, and, and the reason we love working in China is exactly because of that extreme speed at which things need to happen. And, and so we, it's a very good challenge for us like, to, to be able to deliver engaging spaces in, in front of that kind of challenge, right? Like, because if we don't try to engage with that challenge, like, we know what's going to happen. Like, what's going to be built is uh, what's going to be immediate called practical. But like, I think AI and other tools like could help democratize uh, engaging examples of design, right? Like, and that uh, if if room room GPT can learn from anything, why should it learn from like the kind of you know terrible boxes of modernism from the 20th century? Like, why not learn from like it, the heritage of India or China or? Uh, which is all very possible, right? Like, and and so we we just need to digitize that. Uh, and so I do think like democratizing part of the role of architects, at least the way I think about it, is is digitizing and and making available data and uh, examples from which uh, you know machines can learn and augment and can be then distributed. So I, I no longer think that like uh, it is expensive to create good design, and that's that's what I hope AI can deliver. That uh, it can deliver good design at scale uh, for cheap. Yeah. Thank you. That's brilliant. Any would you like add? We're going to pick up another question. Is there another question? Rian. Hi, my name is Rhiannon Williams. I'm in the Foresight team. Um, thank you all for your, your speeches tonight. Uh, I'm just really interested in picking up this idea of um, what's being democratized and looking at that a bit more. And I, I think um, obviously there's, um, there's skills that are being made more available that's really useful. But 
I also think there's there's something being lost in terms of, I guess, um, if we're taking this shortcut to these products, uh, a lot of the a lot of the discussion seems to be about skills being lost or skills being replaced. But I'm wondering whether there's something more in terms of um, the creative process being lost. So if somebody is instead of creating a mood board, they're generating an instant image of what they want their result to look like. Um, to me, there's something lost there in terms of. Uh, what references are being used and what's being thought of because they're able to generate something from um, previous existing completed projects or references. Uh, and I just, I wonder if, if you recognise that as well, whether you think there's something that we're in danger of, of losing there and becoming more kind of generic just in the way that, um, I mean, as we get data, um, whether it be biased data or just data that's all swayed in one kind of direction because of how things have accumulated and things have accumulated over the years. Um, yeah, it feels to me that there is there is something there that's very, very different from a process where somebody has thought about this for a very long time rather than generated something immediately. And I know it's a very obvious point of, of conversation in this field, that's uh, especially over the past couple of months. Um, but yeah, I, I'm curious to know whether you see something being lost there that's quite crucial and emotional and philosophical as well. So less about skills being lost, more about like the way we think and, and create. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you go for it, Frederick. Yeah, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, the very important topic, I believe. I agree. Um, so, I think we we should be careful what what is in the media, what is put out there as tools. Um, well, mainly it's from certain companies who have a vested interest in putting these out there. Uh, and they're not putting out there other things that are happening in the lab, for example. So if we look at what's happening in the labs, uh, we would see that the, the topic of, for example, skills, uh, archiving knowledge is an old topic uh, which is current, uh, and it's an important one. Uh, it may not be well, maybe not well supported. I, I don't necessarily know what's happening at Google or etc. without having to name them all, but um, the idea that uh, skills are lost is an old topic. It's a very interesting one because it's a very difficult one. Archiving knowledge, again, is is a big challenge in research. And there's a lot of work going on, and, and it's been going on for decades. Um, so you know, I could refer you to some projects I've come across, but there, there, are, there are many others. Um, People pass away, uh, we lose uh, masters, experts all the time, they simply, their life ends. And it's a pity we have a lot of technology that should allow us to keep this knowledge current and then transfer it to uh, younger generations. So this is a, a big topic. Uh, maybe we don't, as a society, we don't support it enough in terms of investment in research, I would say. Uh, of course, I'm defending my... my <laughs> my garden uh, but but it is happening uh, and there's definitely uh, concern from the research uh, academic community on these topics um, for example recently I had over many years discussions with a teacher of drawing and we put out a sort of a discussion between us and he's very concerned about losing skills exactly the, the points you raise and uh, we we tried to to see how uh, these new tools that exist may actually be used to reverse these phenomena, ph phenomena in, in engaging more uh, people into uh, techniques and skills. Uh, so you could think of tools such as the tools we see that produce beautiful renderings <coughs> to be very explicit about how do you make the rendering happen uh, via uh, your hand or your, your body. Uh, we can do that but it's unfortunately not often promoted in the sort of packages or, or, or tools that are put on the market. Uh, but we can do it, uh, definitely. So we need, to, we need to push forward for these things to be promoted more, I think, and, and uh, turn out and, and be made accessible, not stay in the lab. At the moment, maybe it's too much in the lab, not, outside, not, a, not enough out there. Uh, so hopefully, uh, Everybody here will help us and uh, make this more accessible. I don't know if you want to. Uh, Th thank you. <laughs> thank you. You. 
And you know what, you want to address? Uh, in inter on International Women's Day, I think <laughs> it's an, yes. appro an appropriate question. It may be that these AIs are trained on a male-dominated world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I probably won't, won't, won't go there. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think in terms of creativity, so I, I kind of uh, just I think it's definitely a process just uh, because I also practice design before and I, when I use ChatGPT or any sort of skill that can automate some of the creative process, I was actually quite excited about it. It's like, oh my God, I can just do this mood board in one, like in five minutes <laughs> instead of, I don't know, half a day. Um, so I think from my point of view, it's, there's definitely some processes missing, but what maybe more importantly is to, again, like, going like understanding what's happening and use that to facilitate the process to really make it more effective. I think that's like really a, a become more a fun way to treat that AI as just another colleague that also coming up with new ideas and I can work with that to brand, brainstorm that idea together. Um, yeah, and I really like the idea of being uh, democratizing all the technology or, or lower the barrier, entry barrier for people who want to do generative art, architecture or video game. I, I, I really think that's uh, one Instagram started a lot of photographers really don't like it. It's like, oh, why well, I'm, I'm posting my outstanding picture, photo in such a small square and everyone can post something, can like dilute the culture a bit. But over time, you really just bring more people to the photography area, like everyone take picture, everyone has kind of like trying to have a sense of, I don't know, aesthetic throughout the uh, fine viewers. So I, I think, I think yeah. that's, that's a positive thing uh, for the culture to have more people coming up to this topic. So yeah, I'm, I guess I'm just more optimistic <laughs> about, about having this new tool. Yeah, I also tend to agree with that kind of, like the more people who can come into architecture, engineering, and, and you know, general, the built environment, uh, particularly young talent that can come into the fields, uh, we need that, right? And, and because without new talent, we're not gonna fix the problems. Uh, that face or the challenges at least that face us and and so and I also rather optimistic that there will always be a feedback loop like so today I provides us something like but as a, as a species like we generally like will come up with some other creative use of all those tools right like it, it's so it's it's already we can see as, as the example of photography was mentioned like uh, that it, the, the level of photography didn't go down, and there was a, a greater demand for you, like the masters, uh, tutorials about photography, like and 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 so on. But like maybe some parts of the analog photography kind of um, uh, died. But the, 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 there's tons more uh, content, like educational content, to learn from. Like so, I do think that. In general, like the level of photography and uh, was improved by Instagram, like and and same way, level of graphic design was accelerated through the advent of like Web 2.0, when they were every everybody needs a website. So obviously, graphic design community was accelerated in its development. So I do I do hope that similarly, like architecture and and uh, can can be accelerated through 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 these tools um, and continue to evolve like more rapidly like and and so uh, yeah it, uh, there can be the danger of a negative feedback loop like I, it could happen that like you know what uh, what humans are absorbing are like some of the negative sides of like what AI produces so there is that danger but like I do think in general um, positive things could uh, definitely come out of um, uh, of the advent of uh, automation. Yeah. Thank you. So we are uh, 20 minutes. Drinks uh, are waiting. Is there one last question that we pick up and then we ask Julio to uh, wrap us up? Yeah. Thank you very much. Hi, hello there. Uh, my name is Alessandro Ciaffordoni. I'm from a designer uh, for, with the landscape uh, design architecture team with ICP. And uh, I had, um, I just read recently an unpublished article by David Rutten. Uh, he works at McNeil. He's uh, uh, one of the head developers for Grasshopper. 
And uh, a bit of echoing the last question, he uh, his unpublished piece was called The Utter and, in and Inevitable Demise of the Architectural Practice. And it, it, it was made it with clickbait on purpose. And one of the main, uh, he his, his whole article basically is based on three main points. One, the, the negative side of it being where basically uh, the lo the process of creating is gonna and, and design and creativity is gonna be lost on their way for the fact of better and faster procedures. The second being a follow up of that same negative side where uh, society is gonna take onto these different environments as a mirror to what it represents. So it follows a lot that point of garbage in, garbage out to a certain degree. And it's not only related to uh, the built environment itself would be also related to other examples for like Twitter bots that happened before and were basically hijacked to uh, represent a lot of negative societal, uh, the negative part of society. Um, but then at the very end, he closes up saying the fact that these are all just intermittent tools that are just tools and it's just the same part of the process. So now it leads me to the, the actual question is, when we're talking about intelligence, at the end of the day, all these processes are, we feed information to the model or to a machine or to a process or to an algorithm, and it creates a syntactic, syntactic and syntax uh, relation between the two, but it's still only seeing and replicating. There's not that intelligence, I guess here's where the artificial part comes into the intelligence, but the inherent intelligence of you know, a baby or a newborn seeing an object and inherently knowing more or less what it is and how it falls into the space and his life is not there. But how do, would you, do we, are we really there of having artificial intelligence or proper intelligence? No. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, pardon my French. Um, no, no. Um, yeah, there's a lot of worries that are vehiculated, I think, in the media, or even in uh, by researchers. Um, I didn't have much time to, to to talk about what I mean by intelligence uh, in my s with l those few slides, but um, I hope I carried the idea that um, there is we can talk about levels of intelligence for any um, beings that are able to act on their environment. Um, and if we look at this definition of cognitive horizon, we also have the time dimension. And AI systems have the ability to <coughs> uh, navigate through these dimensions. So they have some levels of intelligence. But this is not human intelligence. and. Um, all kinds of species that surround us, they also have certain levels of intelligence. Um, what makes human different is what is interesting here. Does AI achieve human intelligence? No, uh, just because we actually don't quite understand what human intelligence uh, is based upon. We have ideas, we have some knowledge, uh, but it's a, it's a discovery and it's an ongoing process. So we're still in the early days, for example, of cognitive science. Uh, it's a very re recent field. In fact, I would say most of the fields that are relevant to AI today, um, these other disciplines, they are very recent as well. Psychology is like 100 years old, maybe a little more. Um, so we are really in early days. It's the infancy of AI that we live through. Uh, I like the, the idea of these are tools. You I think you mentioned the, the third point raised was that it was a sort of more positive in the sense that uh, we should think of what these systems are providing us as being under our control. Um, when you were elaborating these points, uh, the first thing I thought of was um, any AI system that I'm aware of today depends completely on the human, for example, in, or in order to judge the quality of what's produced. So the, the notion that we understand how human find something, let's say, beautiful uh, or useful is something that actually we don't fully understand. Uh, why do human you know, like 
something and don't like something else is an interesting question to which we don't have the full answers. Uh, so to pretend that the uh, sort of software system would uh, already have the answers is you know, more fantasy than reality, I would say. Um, so let's, you know, I, w I wouldn't be pessimistic uh, from that angle. And uh, more like what we said before, I think what's going to happen is, is uh, more people will engage with disciplines which probably before they would just stay away, it would seem too complicated. Um, in my area of teaching, for example, um, it's, it's been the case that it's been difficult often to engage uh, people coming from more artistic background into more a uh, mathematical or software background. Uh, but over the years, especially in the last decade or so, it's becoming much easier because we have much better tools. So in fact, a lot more people think, I think now today can engage with these other disciplines that before maybe they thought, you know, this is, I was not raised in that, in that field, therefore I cannot be there. Uh, I see that more as, again, this democratization of, of, of all these disciplines and spaces. So I'm, I would say, uh, rather optimistic, um, but we should be criticizing when we, we hear in the media that AI will take the jobs, AI will do this and that. Uh, AI today is dependent on human knowledge. It's trained based on human knowledge. It doesn't have really good judgment. Uh, the humans need to be in the loop. They're in the loop in producing the systems to begin with. And, and this is good, I think, because it means that these systems that we're producing, they're for humans. They're not, you know, these things that will have their own taste and do things just for them. That's just science fiction. Um, so hopefully this provides some this is a follow up for the discussion. This is a great no, a positive note uh, to conclude. And we pass on the word to, uh, to Julio. You want to conclude? Yeah, well, yes. Well, uh, um, unless uh, you want to answer or add something. <laughs> Go for it. Yeah, well, uh, it, it's been really interesting um, event, I think, for me, uh, because I'm really keen into this topic. And uh, uh, from what we were saying, um, the idea that we feed the machine with data, if we take away our data, the machine doesn't have anything to eat. So what happens if we are gone and the machine keeps feeding on the same data all over and over? It's kind of like, if you imagine like an evolutionary system where there is no data anymore, but you're always relying on the old system, everything dies off. So it's kind of promising that at least the machine, when we'll be really clever, will need us and will keep us alive. <laughs> 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 so uh, a big uh, round of applause for our guests, <laughs> for uh, Friedrich, Ting, CJ, Alviso for running the show. Uh, hoping to do more of this evening, every month maybe one, I don't know, but uh, maybe in a couple of months we'll have another one. And now there is a lot to drink and a lot to eat because there are not 200 people like they were booked. So <laughs> let's go, let's attack. Thank you very much. Thank you.